So this morning we did already a session with the US group and we did a kind of introduction of uh, our work, uh, of the direction that we would like to take uh, in this uh, study, because this is really, uh, I, I'm taking this as a research really, because I've been inspired for many uh, years actually to, um, to nurture more like workers circles. And um, back then when you would say the word like workers, people would say like, what? <laughs> Even people that are like initiated, that are in this uh, domain for a long time, they would not necessarily understand what the word light work means. And, and so I had a long, long time to think about it and to actually um, realize that um, the light work is something that is intrinsically <laughs> uh, Jewish. And this is what we spoke about uh, this morning is that we were looking uh, actually where this light work um, concept is coming from. Um, so the light body of Adam was going to enable him to be a, basically a darkness transmuter. Now we are uh, given the content of the information of the light work through the Torah. But uh, of course the Torah has many layers. Uh, we have the, you know, the Pardes, the Pshat, Drash, Remez, and Sod. And for people who really want to understand the content of the, the, the mystical aspect of this light work, it's important to tap into the last layer, which is the layer of Sod, which is Kabbalah. Now, the thing is that um, the direction that Judaism has taken, unfortunately, with, with uh, diasporas and, you know, the history, the course of history, the, the, the way we know it happened, a, a lot of this uh, knowledge and ancient wisdom has been kind of lost in a way because, um, you know, because for some reason Kabbalah was not taught as much as it used to during uh, before before the diaspora, but uh, now you know there are many ways to recover this content and to the, the and to, to 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 be able to do this light work. The most important is that to be able to do this light work, we need to actually uh, take care of the light vessel. Okay, so most of the uh, Torah guidelines and the prescriptions that we are actually receiving in the Torah, they are actually meant to uh, take care of the light vessel, to take care of the integrity of the light vessel, that the light vessel will remain uh, proper in order to be able to channel the proper um, frequency and nurture the proper connection that we are supposed to have with God, which is supposed to be, as we saw this morning, but you will uh, hear it in the video, uh, is that the connection of Avram and the descendant of Avram was supposed to go through um, a divine manifestation that comes through the name Avaye, Yud Hev He, and not through the name Elohim, which is the connection that the, the nations are supposed to entertain. And so it doesn't mean that, okay. And so basically what we uh, need to do is to take care of this light vessel. And the moment this light vessel is uh, actually um, restored, the, the, the integrity of the light vessel is restored, we are going to be able to channel again this light and reestablish the balance. The fact that God created a space for darkness in this dimension, it came with many rules. One of the rules is that we cannot, God cannot interfere by preventing the darkness actually to create disorganization. But what he did is that he created some security system to make sure that there would be always actors that would maintain the balance between light and darkness. And the, the actors that are part of the security system are the Bnei Adam. 
the Bnei Adam, there are when they are actually channeling the divine light on earth, they are automatically equalizing the level of darkness and light. So the, the, the security system that is put in place to prevent the darkness to, to completely take over is that uh, there are some human beings that are implemented within the, the, the planet that have the power to contain a lot of light. They are light containers. And if they are calling upon the light, in that case, it doesn't mess up with the rules of the duality paradigm that God has established for this dimension. In that case, it's not called a divine intervention. It's a human intervention. And we have the free will to decide that we want that intervention. So for that reason, most of the balance that can be reestablished between light and darkness can only happen through human, uh, through the human uh, media. Okay, and that makes us responsible <laughs> somehow uh, of uh, a lot. And actually it just shows us that we have a lot of power because whatever is happening, you know that whatever uh, is happening on this uh, dimension is something that is a reflection that is happening in higher dimension. You know, so uh, as below, so as above, so below. And so, Whatever is happening here that, we, that seems to be um, uncontrollable, if we actually do properly the light work, we can access higher dimensions where when we do the light work, is reestablishing the balance on etheric plane, and then automatically the balance will be reestablished on material plane, on a physical plane, okay? Now, it's very important to understand um, the principle of uh, the, the, the fact that we, uh, because we have the free will, we are the only one that can actually choose to reestablish the balance between darkness and light. If you, uh, if you consider the power of the divine light, the power of the divine light can transmute any darkness at all. Normally, if you know, the divine light is infinite, right? The divine light is infinite and the divine light has the power to transmute any darkness. The reason why it doesn't do it, it's because this divine light needs to be invited by human beings. Because they are the ones who are holding the free will and therefore they are the only one who can actually invite without the divine presence on earth without messing up with the rules that have been established for this world. And humanity. Yes, so the Bnei Adam, they have the capacity to contain the most light among the human, uh, uh, among the, 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 on va dire, the beings that are on the planet. They are the ones who have the potential to contain the more light. Now, the, this potential is coming with a responsibility, which is to actually host the divine light on earth. And that's the, the, the reason why God is saying, Vasuli Mishkan Veshachanti Betochechem, make me a sanctuary within your heart so I can reside among you. Why does God need us to make a sanctuary within our heart in order to be invited on the planet? He made the, he made the world. Why does he need us to be invited? And the reason is that because what we explained before. So when we are using our free will to host this divine light on earth, we are actually changing the balance, the energetic balance that is uh, in place. We are actu actually, we can change everything like that. Okay? And so now we have this light container, this light vessel that is existing on individual level but we also have a light container on collective level, okay? So we need to take care of our light vessel on individual level, and we also need to take care of our light vessel on collective level. Now, the light vessel on the collective level, and that's why we need to do this work <laughs> in a circle, 
on uh, e with a collective because if you and you and you and you you choose to be the representant of the collective and you come and in the name of the collective we do a work together we are actually accessing the common light vessel of the collective okay and now we can go even further we know that uh, with uh, quantum healing or spiritual healing in general we know that we can shift the vibrational frequency of you know of anyone okay by actually identifying the codes in your system because you're a system of information okay all of us we are a system of information and we all are holding a certain frequency this frequency is the sum of everything that you of your level of consciousness basically everything that you have acquired in the past in your past lives and in your present life uh, all the wisdom your vibrational frequency is also impacted by the imprints and the wounds and the, the the scars and the patterns that you are holding as an individual okay and so uh, of course for you it's already very easy <laughs> it's repeating and repeating it's good <laughs> but we are also holding the same thing on a collective level okay and so the same way that your vibrational frequency is uh, attracting is is uh, attracting events or people you are attracting events or people in your life because of your vibrational frequency with the law of resonance because of the law of resonance you are going to attract people that are on the same vibration as you you're going to attract events that are on the same vibrational level as you it is the same for the collective all the patterns and the wounds and the imprints that are we are holding on the collective all of this is making one big vibrational average vibrational frequency <clears throat> and this vibrational frequency is attracting by resonance events you know friends or enemies that are uh, that want to interact with this vibrational frequency now that's the reason why we need to explore what are the patterns that we are actually holding what are the ones that we are still holding as a collective that we can let go of and all the imprints that are actually kind of uh, you know disturbing uh, and preventing us to rise in frequency as a collective and we are going to explore a little bit all of those patterns and <clears throat> the moment we are opening this circle with this intention I invite all of you to become aware of the patterns that, because I'm going to propose some but I invite all of you to of course to uh, you know bring bring up whatever comes uh, into your mind of the patterns that we are holding as a collective that need to be shifted and the moment we are going to become aware of it we are uh, uh, going to shift them together okay and so how are we going to access the collective consciousness there are many ways possible there are many ways we can and that's what i'm proposing really i'm proposing to enter the system to crack the code and replace it so oh, that's a code gene, gene editing then, yeah exactly exactly genes editing yes. yeah so the thing is that when i was the more i was thinking about it you know i was thinking a lot about it lately because I'm doing this mentorship program where it's a lot about, you know, editing the, the, the codes on individual level. And I was like, if it works on the individual level, it should work on the collective. It means that we just have to enter the system of the collective. And we know that the, we all belong to one soul. We all have one big consciousness. We are all, in Kabbalah, it's said that we are connected to one big brain. Okay? So if we, have, if we can enter that consciousness, that soul you know that big brain we enter there as a collective you know as a representative of the collective <clears throat> change the paradigm at the beginning at the origin at the blueprint <clears throat> and that's the reason why i'm inviting in the circle i'm inviting the imaot and the avot and adam and chava 
Every time before you entered, I opened the sacred circle and I invited them because we need them to show us exactly what code to rewrite. Okay, now by exploring a little bit, you know, the, the, the Tanakh and the Parashiot, Bereshit, Noach, Lech Lecha, Vayera, Chayesara, Toldot, actually all the, all the Sefer Bereshit until now, we can see a lot of information. A lot of information about the patterns that are, that we can already, <coughs> so sorry about that, I don't know what happened today. Uh, so um, we are actually we can observe many uh, different patterns uh, I was observing the pattern of justification you know this need that we have to justify that we have a place that uh, we have the right to exist that we have uh, that we are good people <clears throat> that we are not stealing anything, neither the resources, neither the land. Uh, all of those uh, uh, patterns, because those are patterns. This is something that is repetitively going on, ongoing, that we feel being, uh, we feel being accused, we feel that we need to, uh, that we are judged and whatever we are saying is not going to, is, to be believed. All of those patterns we can actually find the code, the beginning, the origin where it's actually written, okay, and shift them. All of us, when the events happened, we were actually, our soul was there and our body was here. And that was also one of the reasons why we were feeling uh, numb and we were feeling like completely uh, unable to do anything. It's because actually our soul was there and was leaving this event with the collective. And, um, but um, it's very important actually in order for you to do this work to uh, actually call back the maximum of portions of soul where you are because uh, you actually need the power of your soul at home, where you are, within your body. And so, of course, you can leave a little spark there that uh, gives you a report of what's happening uh, energe energetically, but it's very important to, to, um, to really call it back now, wherever you are. So now you're in Paris, you call it back in Paris. You know, you want to leave one person there, leave one person there, <laughs> but call it back here. Otherwise, you won't be able to do anything. And so for all of you that have other parts of your soul anywhere else, same, call it back. Uh, and the way to call it back would be just, you know, I call back all the parts of my soul right now within, within my body because I need you at home right now. And so that could be a part of your soul that is uh, stuck somewhere in the timeline or that could be in a geographical uh, location. It doesn't matter. I think it's incredibly draining to keep that tethered. When, yeah. when a big part of that, like what Milena is saying about, because I feel it's so powerful. I've never felt it so strongly that the weight of the tethering itself, like the connection between two fragments of, of us, that is one is there and one is wherever you are, but the, the bandwidth of that is actually a huge uh, tax of energy. Yeah. I feel it, it's like draining. Yes, because you are maintaining, you are, you are always like in, in between two different frequencies. You're there, you have to adapt to the frequency there, and you're here, you have to adapt your, to your frequency here, and you're always like in a state of self-regulation when you need to adjust, 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 and of course it's draining. And so for that reason, uh, it's very important to not do that when you are in a period where you are recovering your energy. So now if, so what you can do in general is to call back your aura, to retract your aura with the intention to retract it, you know, 
you just emit the intention said I said that my intention is to retract my aura now you retract it and then when you need for some you know you need to tune in to whatever is happening outside because you need to you know take some use or whatever you can ex expand again your aura and when you are expanding actually you tap into what's happening there but you cannot do that constantly <laughs> you cannot do that uh, yeah, you cannot do that constantly. You have to do that when you decide to do that. You say, hey, right now I'm expanding. Okay, this is happening. Okay, now back to contraction. Okay. Can I ask you, yes. how do you do that? If you, have, if you have somebody you love so much there, you feel so, so there, you know, it's, I can't imagine doing it. It's painful. Yes, uh, I know what you mean, but the problem is that um, if you're losing your energy uh, and you're not able to actually do anything interesting with this energy, is it a nice way to, to invest this energy? That's just a question you need to ask yourself. Do I want to invest my energy like this? And so learning to regulate your energy when you are in this period, it's something I, it's very important to speak about even before, you know, starting to speak about patterns and about theory and about all of this is really to speak about how to maintain a, a high vibration. And there is also something that I would like to uh, mention because we, we spoke a lot about uh, in our mentorship program, we spoke about a lot about um, when you feel bad, how can you feel good when other people feel bad? How can you be happy when others are unhappy? How can you uh, think of uh, things that are, you know, tafel when uh, some people are going through uh, very hard uh, trouble? And so we, we, were, we were, you know, um, we were mentioning a lot. Uh, we were mentioning uh, this this work about deciding how much how you want to invest your energy. But also, I wanted to add something I couldn't uh, add in this group is the concept of no se be all in chavero. Mm. The concept of no se be all in chavero. Whether you are uh, uh, whether you have this this uh, knowledge about you know this J jewish concepts or not this um this is very uh, embedded in your in your unconscious because this is something that your ancestors have been carried it is in our collective consciousness the concept of no sebeol in chavero is to carry the the weight of your friend you know if you see your friend uh, I don't know how to say that in a good English. If you see your friend like feeling under the weight, uh, like he's carrying, you know, something very heavy, you go and you help him carry that. Okay? So that's a Jewish uh, concept that's in the Torah, like, you know, the, the, that's a mitzvah, <laughs> to go and help your friend <laughs> to carry the weight. And because of that, um, Let's say that we are we are taken to um, places that are actually not exactly right. What is it? What, how can you be? How can you actually honor uh, this uh, concept without being drained yourself and uh, while spending wisely your energy? That's a question that is very important to ask because. <clears throat> if you feel guilty to rise your vibrational frequency, now we are in the month of Adar and we're supposed to be joyful. Okay? Michel Nichnas Adar, Marbim Besimcha. How can we be joyful when, you know, some of our brothers are still, uh, in, uh, are still uh, abducted, you know, are still uh, prisoners? Uh, when uh, so many uh, people are still suffering from the consequences of what happened and it's still very raw and it's not finished. How can we cultivate joy in this case? You know, let's imagine that you have it all good, you're safe in your house, you haven't been disturbed by anything. Will you feel giddy being joyful now? 
Are you able to feel really 100% joyful? Are you able to be joyful? Yes. Baruch <laughs> Hashem. So the thing is that I was speaking with a lot of people recently that, you know, they go and they help here and there. They bring me and they do this and they do that to the point that they drain themselves so much that finally they are wrecked and they are not even able to be useful for their family. And so we, the, this question raised, this question raised, uh, how much do I have to carry of the burden of my brother <laughs> to be a good person? How much do I have to refrain from being joyful to be a good person? To be a considerate and, you know, uh, uh, you know, considerate human being, empathic human being. And so the thing is that I think we have to, to take it in a sense that is much more uh, subtle <laughs> than the way it is explained, that is translated, let's say. And um, first of all, something that is very important to know is that when you keep your vibration high, everybody knows that, when you keep your, high vibration, your vibration high, you are actually serving the collective because through you, through you, the light can enter and you can be a transmuter. You cannot be a transmuter if you are sad, if you're holding low vibrational frequency, if you're holding guilt, if you're holding uh, resentment, if you're holding hatred, all of, all of the low vibrational uh, uh, emotion, you know, all the emotions that um, are of low vibration, if you're holding them in your field, you are not able to receive the light. You are not able to be a light holder and even less a wor light worker, okay? So the light work cannot be done through you. The darkness cannot be transmuted through you if you keep low vibration in your field. I, I feel, can I add to that? Chakra? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like the word I, that Chava is saying, I feel just to, just to share for, my, yes. for myself. I, yes. I feel like it's, for me, it's not theory. It's in practice what I've been working on the last few months when, when the war broke out, um, I, don't, I was in Israel during that time and everyone was just going volunteer. And, and deep inside, I knew that I wasn't supposed to volunteer. I was supposed to go to Bali. But the guilt of not doing the right thing just made me completely numb to a point that I was sitting on the bed doing nothing and saying I'm feeling guilty for not going for not going on here because I know I was supposed to but I'm feeling guilty not going to Bali. Long story I'm gonna fast forward, when I did come to Bali I was still feeling guilty for, for not being in Israel. And meaning it took time and for me to realize that these patterns of guilt they're, they're first of all, they're not helping me in order to rise to where I'm supposed to, but it's also part of what Shabbat was talking about, about patterns in the Jewish people, I think. For me, I realized, working through it, I realized there's so much guilt of also just generational guilt of like, of, of being victims for so many years, right? Like, I have this, like, my grandparents went through the Holocaust, and I realized, okay, there's a connection about being victims when you're feeling guilty about it. Like there's, these are the patterns that I feel that they're not only personal, they're, they're part of who we are in the, as a nation that we need to learn how to heal in order to start rising and, and, and get like growing into our power more. Um, so I don't know if that, that helps simplify. Um, and so how, how, how was it for you when you came here, <laughs> when you arrived in Bali, and I told you, okay, first of all, you go to the ocean for, would you stay there one week? <laughs> you go to Migve, and after you come back, and then we talk. Um, and then how was it for you to go from this guilt to being able to receive light again? It's life, it was life-changing. I was like a completely different person landing here. I, I couldn't move. Chava, I saw Chava, she's like, go to the beach, go into the ocean, let it like cleanse you out energetically. Because I, I wasn't functioning, I just wasn't functioning at all. 
And and also and also the soul was true love. Is I still wanted to be there even after I worked through the guilt and wanted and then knew okay just like bring calling it back. And slowly, slowly, I feel like my soul was just opening up, but I first felt like I had to clear all of that first. And not realizing that it was just, it's like walking in mud, like basically, it's all these, like, the, the, for me at least, the guilt, it's like I'm walking in mud, and I'm not even going, I think I'm walking, I'm not even walking. Yeah. So how did you shift the guilt? The guilt? <laughs> Um, the guilt I did with the family, there was many, many, a lot, a lot of healing, but first I just recognized the pattern in the family um, lineage of my grandma and, and how that went to me down these different generations of the guilt and victim of the family and deciding I'm not being a victim anymore um, and letting go of that. Um, and, and also, the, the, what about the guilt of not being with your brothers when they need you? What about this one? <laughs> you're, not, you're not letting go. I'm trying to protect myself here, yeah. not be a person. But um, yeah, there's also there's there's many reasons why I feel like I'm supposed to be in Israel right now, not only because of the war, but in, just in general, what's going on. And I don't remember now how I shifted that. You remember? I don't know. Uh, you basically you realize that that that. Um, that holding this uh, guilt was uh, not allowing you to channel the light that you're supposed to, to channel and, and so preventing you to do your work here and there. Yeah, so it's, it was like another, another blockage for me to actually step up to do the, the Jewish light work. Um, like it stopped me from, okay, I did the action of coming to Bali, but my soul wasn't doing the work yet. It wasn't touching the light that I'm supposed to be touching because of the skill. Yeah, so basically, rising your vibrational frequency, it's a must in order to be able to hold light and, you know, even more to do light work. And so, of course, we know that the, the, the best way to rise your vibration is to activate your heart and the emotions that are activating the heart the most and rising the vibrational frequency the most are the emotion of joy, of gratitude and love. And so when you are actually cultivating those emotions and this state of consciousness, you are actually, actually giving a service to all. So it should be a homework to do that. It should, it's a duty that all of us that are that we are not that are still able to do it because we you know Baruch Hashem we were uh, spared somehow this is even more duty to actually rising our vibrational frequency with joy love and gratitude and it's not at all a denial of what our brothers have gone through in the contrary that's the way you can help. So you can still hold space and in you can... To help them, yes, the that that's, the, that's the, the way you can work, help them. So it doesn't prevent you to be there and say, hey, I see you, I want to be there for you, and, and I'm, I'm not, uh, you are not going to go into justification and say, you know, I'm happy not because I, I cannot feel for you, but because it's my light work, you know, my, my spiritual work. But I think that when it's coming from the right place, people feel it automatically. You know, when you go, uh, you go to, uh, to someone and you go with full of energy, you know, you go, let's say you go lenachem someone, you know, console someone that has lost uh, someone dear. And you go with full of energy and, you know, high vibration. Of course, you, you, you are able to give strength to that person. Right? The, uh, for sure, some people are able to focus on that, but it doesn't prevent them to steal that, that their way to hold space for others is by feeling their pain. Of course, and, and I understand. So, and so this is the way, not, not everybody functions in the same way, but that's, that's the way some people find that they are the most uh, showing their care, you know? What do you guys think? 
So the, may I share something? Yeah. Um, it's it. You actually did sort of speak into it in your last minute you spoke, but just to reemphasize, um, it's it's such a huge shift that I made in and around this. Is I'm not actually right there. I'm not in there. So what? What is my role? What is my place in where I am and where I find myself? And and I think one of the things that I've been I learned years and years ago was to say to myself, what purpose does this serve? So when you have an emotion or you're having an experience inside yourself, to just do a check-in and go, what purpose does this serve? Because um, I think the example that you gave around when people are unwell or if somebody's lost somebody and, um, you know, just that that came to mind as well was if someone's really unwell and um, there is so much pain that everybody feels around them that holds them in that very low frequency experience of what they're in and that doesn't serve any purpose and it's not about being joyful and light-hearted in the in the thick of someone else's pain but it's been able to recognize that we are energy and that we are transmitting energy and taking responsibility that if I'm thinking very low density thoughts, low frequency thoughts around that person's illness, that's not supporting their, their health or their return to health. So how can I hold them in my heart? Um, and it's, it's this internal space that you start to dialogue with, um, which is extraordinary. And it's, um, it's a practice, I guess, isn't it? It's something we practice and, and you practice it in every moment and in every experience so that what purpose does it serve? I, I found to be quite a powerful, yeah, kind of bring me back. Mm. Exactly. That's a nice input. And also to ask yourself, mm. you know, if you need to be with someone inside the hall to be able to help, or do you prefer, is it better to be outside of the hall and, you know, throw a rope mm. to help them coming out? And so, so yeah, so that's something to, to really mm -hmm. keep in mind mm -hmm. uh, today as it's Rosh Chodesh Adar and we are going to close the circles uh, soon on this note um, that, uh, you know, the invitation that we have to rise uh, and to cultivate joy, it's, it's a spiritual work. Uh, that is so very important. Mm. And uh, if we are actually just focusing on this, that's, that's already a huge, Im immense <laughs> light work in itself because it's clearing the light vessel and it's allowing the work to, the light to come through. And when the light comes through, you have nothing else to do really, you know, <laughs> because you, you're, you're a light holder and the, the, the need is for the light to be there. And automatically it's equalizing the level of darkness and light. And that's already something in itself that is already huge. Okay. And so because we are, um, Friday, just before Shabbat, we are going to close the light the candles of Shabbat. I would like to share with you a practice um, about lighting candles. Uh, and if you're a man and you don't have a, a, a woman in your house, you can also do it and light the candles. Otherwise, you can uh, teach, you know, your partner or your wife. Um, and it was something that was shown to me while I was lighting the candles already a few months ago. And then two weeks ago, um, it came, uh, there were more details that came. And it was about, I will share it very briefly now, and I would like to invite you to do it if you would like to. And you tell me next week how it was, then maybe we can uh, speak about it even a little bit more. And so that's a little uh, light work uh, uh, you know, homework that I, I give you, I, I let you with, you know, before we close this. And I, I was shown to go, actually, when I light the candle, to go to the center of the, of, the, of the earth, to go inside the heart of the earth and tune my heart to the heart of the earth, okay? Tune to the same frequency of the heart of the earth. And once I'm there, I'm doing the bracha, and when I say Baruch Atah Hashem, I'm actually calling the divine light within me. So now I'm becoming a channel. I'm opening a portal through my crown chakra, and I'm calling the divine light through me. When you say Baruch Atah Hashem, you're just calling the divine light. 
and after the sentence that you say after is the the, 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 the mission that you give to the divine light. You're calling the divine light and you give it a mission to do. You give it a direction. And so when you say Baruch Atah Hashem, then the light is already reaching into your heart. And then Asher Kedisha Nantotam Tzivanu Ladikner Shel Shabbat, you send, the light is already reached you, the center of your heart and you send it like radiating to the heart of the earth and to all the, the periphery of the earth, like, you know, like a huge uh, light uh, flash that goes to the earth and open the pathways. I will uh, just visualize it opening pathways to the earth and we'll explain more about that next time. And just if you would like to try to do this uh, little exercise, you can tell me about it next week. Okay, amazing. So I wish you all Shabbat Shalom. Share with your friends. That would be nice. You know, the more we share this, the more it will be powerful. That's the goal. Okay? Okay, so Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom. Shalom. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom.